those of you that don't know me, I, uh, my name is Hubert Colvin. I'm one of the partners at Hauling & Co, which is the executive search arm of the cybersecurity skills business Adeptus Group. I lead our headhunting services, specializing in leadership appointments in cybersecurity across Europe. And um, I am extremely privileged today to be joined by Smy Grake, Robert Hannigan and Mark Hughes to discuss the uh, cyber threat in a hybrid war. Now, the, the concept of hybrid war may not be entirely new um, and is arguably as old as, as war itself. However, it has gained significant relevance um, in recent years as uh, um, states employ non-state actors and information technology to subdue their adversaries during and often in the absence of, of direct conflict. Um, so we decided to run this webinar as the shocking Russian invasion of Ukraine has further uh, highlighted the prevalence of cyber threat in a hybrid war. As, as the, the tensions grew in the lead up to the Russian invasion, it was expected that any invasion would be supported by devastating cyber operations to disable government or critical infrastructure, hamper Ukraine's surveillance capabilities, cut lines of communication um, to help invading forces. It hasn't necessarily played out that way, or, or at least not yet, um, but cyber attacks are definitely playing a role uh, with reports such as Microsoft's discovery of, of new malware package uh, Fox Blade in Ukraine systems hours before Russia began its invasion um, and calls from Western state governments for businesses to bolster their cyber defences in response to the escalating conflict. So over the course of this discussion, um, we aim to provide some insights into businesses' cyber response um, and what the wider implications of the use of offensive cyber is in, in a hybrid war. So Mark, Robert, Mike, thank you all for, for, for joining us today and, and for giving your time. Um, may I start by asking each of you to just give a, a short introduction to yourself and a, and a few comments on, on the topic. Robert, if I might start start with yourself. Well, hi Hubert and, and very good to, to be on with you. Um, I'm Robert Hannigan, I'm chairman of Blue Voyant Cybersecurity, the international part. Um, Prior to that, 20 years in the UK government and running our uh, signals intelligence NSA equivalent called GCHQ and uh, establishing our national cybersecurity center. Thank you, Robert. Mike. Yeah, uh, well, uh, good afternoon. Well, good morning, actually, everyone. Sorry. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I think my role here is really from a business perspective. You know, I variously was involved for many years at KPMG, chaired a number of public companies including BT, where I, uh, Mark and I worked together, and Robert was an important partner to us in GCHQ and the elements we work on. And I've continued to be involved through the CBI and other businesses from the, uh, that, I, that I'm involved in from a private equity point of view. Thank you, Mike. And Mark? Yeah, because uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Hughes. I'm the president of security at DXC Technology. Uh, prior to that, as Mike just said, I was at BT. I've been at DXC for a, a couple of years, uh, where I lead and manage all the security for uh, the IT services business that is DXC. Uh, we run and provide infrastructure for most of the large Fortune 500 companies across the globe. Uh, and I specifically focus on uh, the securing all of that environment and also then selling security services uh, to our customers. Um, so that's what I get up to. Thank you. So to, to kind of kick off the, the, the conversations, yesterday, NCSC gave support of Biden's call for, for companies to bolster their, their cyber defense of it in response to, to the um, rising conflict. Um, some of the advice given is to take more aggressive approach to patching and vulnerability um, and uh, delaying significant system changes that aren't security related, extending SOC operations, uh, procuring threat feeds that, that might relate to the heightened threat specifically. So, Mike, from, from your experience at that board level, do you, is, is that message starting to sink in? Is the conversation happening? Yeah, so I would say, I would, I would say two things. One is, you know, for, for increasingly over the last 15, 20 years, and increasingly in the last 10 years, you know, a lot of focus has been put on the need on critical national infrastructure to have cyber defense, which we at BT were heavily involved with GCHQ and involving. So I think there was an, been an increasing awareness of ransomware, of malware, of the implications it can have. So there was this backdrop of understanding to it. I think the danger is always people become a bit complacent because I think we've developed much better systems, much better disciplines of protection. But as we all know, accidents happen uh, through lack of discipline or through cleverness. 
and we we obviously continue to see ransomware we don't always know where ransomware has been implied and dealt with and obviously we've seen some very big attacks with the classic ones on the american financial system by the russians about the iranians i think sorry 10 15 years ago um the attack on putting out nearly put out 50 percent of, of saudi arabia's oil output in the aramco attack and conversely, although we don't talk about it much, clearly the West has offensive capabilities. And we saw the Americans, the Israelis, uh, you know, spinning some uh, nuclear uh, condensers. I can't remember the exact term. Uh, so they were destroyed. So we, we've seen this. And I, I think all the boards I'm involved in work suddenly work up, you know, Putin's on the back foot. What will he do? And I, I think there was a sort of high and tight level of the need to really be on top of this, really be observant. Um, that's what, what, I, what I would say so far. I mean, we should pursue the discussion. Um, it, it doesn't feel like there's been a huge amount of attack yet uh, from Russia. It seems the other way around, actually, where we've seen people like Anonymous moving into television stations and quite interesting developments. And I had the privilege, the last thing I'd say, I had the privilege you know, to attend uh, a dinner, a small dinner recently with the previous head of National Cyber Security Center, making the point that these very sophisticated attacks and, and Robert and Mark would know much more about this than me, take a lot of time to plan and execute. They're actually are not things you can turn on the drop of a switch. So, I, I mean, I think that is clearly a need for heightened awareness and you see the that we've had really seemingly very good intelligence from the British and the Americans over the activities and intent of Moscow during the last few weeks in a very horribly sad situation. But it seems the quality of the intelligence has been very good. I mean, very good, it seems. And I wouldn't absolutely would pay even more attention with the warnings we got yesterday from an intelligence perspective. So, I mean, that's where I think business needs to be really focused a little bit on this. Mm. And, and Robert, do you, do you think that the advice that, that there is is it simple enough for businesses to apply? Is it something that companies can look at and say, you know what, we can take that on board and, and do it? No, absolutely, and I agree with Mike. And I, I think there's always a danger of either complacency or thinking it's all too difficult and, and panicking and the cyber industry isn't always very helpful in this. Um, but I, I think we have seen a lot of cyber activity in Ukraine and Russia and spilling over through collateral damage, if you like, into the rest of Europe in the last few weeks. Um, but we would also expect to see some targeted retaliation for sanctions. And I think that's probably what was being referred to yesterday when President Biden uh, issued a, a very specific warning and the FBI have done the same and the NCSC have done the same. So I think, as Mike says, given the intelligence has been pretty good so far, if you're getting that kind of warning, uh, boards probably need to pay attention if they haven't already. But in my experience, I think most boards are already on it. Um, and it's a good time to go through the basics to check that your own network defences are in the right place. And there's some very good advice, including from the NCSC, on what to do in a time of heightened alert. Mm. And then also, uh, because as Mike says, you know, things get through, accidents happen, to dust down your incident response and recovery plans. You know, this is the time for boards to do that, not to micromanage but to check all these things are being done. Um, mm. And I think it, it is possible to defend yourself pretty well. The one new thing I would say to focus on is supply chain because the sophisticated attacks that Mike has talked about from Russia have tended to come through supply chain. They're, they are deeply embedded in supply chain, not just in Ukraine for obvious reasons, but uh, in the West, as we've seen through solar winds and lots of other incidents. Um, so we have to assume that we're only seeing part of uh, the tip of the iceberg, if you like. They must have other stuff uh, ready to go and they must have other accesses ready to uh, operationalize. And that's what we should be worrying about. So worry about your own networks first and then worry about your supply chain and, and ecosystem. Mm. And Mark, from your perspective with, with DHC, I mean, what advice are you giving to, to, to clients there? Are they concerned about it? Are they coming and asking you to say, what are we meant to be doing in a situation like this? Well, yes, they are. And what I see is really picking up on what both uh, what both Mike and Robert were saying. First things first, there is now that much more realisation that as a leading IT services provider, we are part of their supply chain. So, so there is absolutely a lot proactively happening. I have many customers, I'm speaking to many customers every day where we're going through 
our preparedness and our plans and how we work together um, to ensure that if we detect or rather they detect or it, either or either of us detect if there's something untoward how we then collectively respond to that so mm. the first thing i would say is there is definitely a uh, an acceleration in understanding that the you, you, the risk only has to be managed right the way through that that supply chain ecosystem um and it comes back i think to some of those fundamentals that both mike and robert have both said which is first off understanding what the scope of the actualist state is most organizations still struggle with that um and you know it's not surprising with the pace and rate of change especially when you think about the changes that we've made architecturally in many many it estates during COVID as well accelerated use of SaaS and uh, other types of services like that uh you know there have been some fairly fundamental shifts over the last few years which in some respects have meant that you've got even greater complexity around what actually is the IT of a particular organization. Matching that then against what the, the threats are and very specifically the type of threats that we're seeing now to then get to a, a risk position and apply the appropriate controls across that complex environment is becoming harder and harder. Um, and so I think Mike mentioned complacency. You know, one must be in a position where this, as the threat changes, the risk changes to the organization that has to be constantly assessed iteratively. And more often than not, what I see is many organizations thinking, oh, let's keep on going down that controls through tools and technical tools type route. Uh, whereas the reality is that actually it's as much about understanding what the estate is and the, how the parts are working together, working with third parties um, and understanding then how you will react if and when something is detected. Because almost everything I see is that the tooling generally in many organizations is reasonably effective some cases more effective than others but it's the response to those signals that often is the thing that is missed and the ability for an organization to then escalate and create a what can often be quite a low level initially type of impact assessment and response um, before things then get out of hand and it's often that piece which has actually got nothing to do with technical tools which is the piece that is missed where uh, you know governance and how organizations work is probably the primary reason why some organizations fail to, to take that step and then things blow up and then they're into a crisis situation. Understood. And, and Robert, from, from your perspective, the threats that we've seen so far are arguably, and, and it has been reported that what Russia have done, firstly targeting Ukraine in the initial invasions, hasn't nearly been as bad as people might have first thought there doesn't seem to have been major implications to the critical national infrastructure within Ukraine um, in ways that Russia arguably have targeted them previously. So do you think that Russia's use of cyber is as prevalent as, as we may fear it is? I, I think um, I wouldn't underplay what they've done. Um, and of course, there was a phase in, in the last 15 years where they've been aggressively targeting Ukraine for political effects, so switching the power off in the winter for a quarter of a million people, those sorts of things to send political messages. Um, and they did do a lot of softening up just before the invasion, um, massive DDoS attacks against government websites, uh, and some quite sophisticated new um, wiper viruses, which uh, seem to be you know, uh, coming from Russia and there's several different versions even in the last few days. So I wouldn't underestimate what they've done. I guess um, uh, there's a dilemma for them. Once the actual war starts, you know, they also need networks in Ukraine, particularly for propaganda purposes. There are reasons why they don't, particularly when they're expected to have a public government in place, they don't necessarily want a, a scorched earth. They can, of course, just shut down the internet as they have done in Mariupol by, by uh, taking electricity out. And, uh, mm. So uh, it's an easy thing for them to do if they want to just cut it off, but um, that's not necessarily in their best interests. So um, I, I think it was never likely that they would just close everything because they could frankly do that with missiles, um, but mm. they've been doing some fairly destructive stuff and it has spilled over and taking out the satellite um, Lynx has had an impact on Germany, for example, as we saw with German wind farms. So they've been doing some targeted things. Um, and it may be that uh, Ukrainian defences have got better with help from the West in the last uh, couple of years. And so that may have helped a bit. Um, but uh, 
I, I think I think we shouldn't be too complacent about what they may have in store. And obviously, you mentioned there the the kind of overspill that was was off was was arguably seen quite catastrophically with the, the NotPetya circumstances back in uh, in 2017. But um, is that a real risk under the current circumstances that something like that could happen again? Yeah, absolutely. Ah. NotPetya was a great example, both of a supply chain attack through a company, a, a accountancy software company, no one had ever heard of, um, which was poorly defended and of collateral damage. So they didn't really care where this went till it went to famously to Maersk and lots of other big companies uh, in other countries who weren't part of the targeting. So we can expect that uh, to happen again, but I think also we can expect some targeted uh, attacks. It would be strange if they didn't try to retaliate for sanctions, for example, going for financial services. Um, you know, why wouldn't they? It's very consistent with their methodology over the last 20 years. Uh, they will go for critical national infrastructure. And uh, we have a lot to do to defend those. I, I think we've got much better collectively over the last 15 years, but I don't think any company would say they are, they are perfectly defended and that would be kind of a rash thing to say. Mm. And um, Mike, to, to, to Robert's point earlier, the, the, the comments from, from Biden and NCSC and the FBI recently are probably targeted around the, the, the sanctions that, uh, that are being imposed, but also where, where businesses are making their own decisions about their, their investments into Russia, their operations in Russia. Alongside those decisions, are they then considering that they might be making themselves more of a target to um, cyber offences from Russia by, by taking that stance? Yeah, I mean, this is actually a, a, a really difficult uh, area because, you know, on the one hand, you can argue that companies have been ahead of politicians in sort of the morality question, the customer reaction, the man in the street reaction to engagement with Russia. On the other hand, there is increasing concern. Are we, and this is an open question, I don't know the answer, are we really thinking about these sanctions in a very strategic way? Because there are some really important limitations. You know, what we do to him will just directly damage us in terms of suspending immediately oil and gas, for example, would create all sorts of other political and economic uh, issues. So, you know, I think there's, there's a degree of emotion going on that, that I hope people will start to become slightly more uh, perhaps strategic about there's this meeting with Biden and EU and the UK coming up in the next few days where I, I think people have got to think very strategically on the one hand about how this is going to work what's the damage we do unto ourselves both directly and indirectly and how do we frankly speaking um, give Putin you know to some degree strategically it's so important not to give in, but to give him a way out. So mm. how does all of this work? In the meantime, um, you know, and, and again, you know, you know, Robert and Mark have referred to this, you know, we, we shouldn't, um, they for sure are planning something, will have been planning something. What they did to Ukraine, they did previously to Georgia, you'll recall. So, you, you know, how far they want to push it and how far they want to push the reaction. Is really question. The last thing I'd, I'd say in relation to that, and I, I think Mark certainly touched it, Robert too, I think I chair a quite a large consumer finance company. And we're starting to worry a lot, not just about our systems, our domestic network. We're starting to really worry about our partners, the banks. You know, what is going to happen? And I happen, I mean, interestingly, courtesy of Ian Lobham, actually, Robert, your predecessor, had arranged for me in a very interesting meet, go to, go to the NSA to discuss the way that the UK was dealing actually with things like Huawei and other things, and how, um, which, which was interesting. And I was there during the Iranian attack on the banks. And it was extraordinary because it was live. They didn't, amazing, they didn't cancel my visit. They explained to me what was going on. And what was truly disturbing was that, I mean, Robert will know more about this, but a significant number of the banks under attack didn't even know they were under attack at that time. Now, hopefully things have moved on, but it illustrates a lot of, you know, that really nearly became a really serious issue for the financial markets. And you've got to believe that something like this is at least being planned, considered to, to, to carry out. 
And and Mark, to that, <laughs> do you feel do you feel that the businesses are more aware now of when they are being attacked? Is is there um, detection capabilities improved enough to be able to identify where these threats are coming from and when they're coming? In short, no. Uh, so I look at what we have done over the last you know 10, 15 years. Billions of dollars have been spent on various cybersecurity technologies and controls. Uh, I think that you know when you actually look at the types of attacks that are happening. Uh, and, the, and when you really unpick the methodology that is used by the threat actors to get into organizations, it's still relatively rudimentary stuff that is being exploited. And so there is this curious mismatch between despite having spent a lot with all the focus on everything else, that when we get to the, actually what's happening inside the uh, inside most organizations, when you take when you pick apart, as I say, the anatomy of the attack, uh, you still see the usual suspects of unpatched VPNs, of phishing mails, and all those sorts of things happening. So there is still a need uh, for many organizations to double down. And you mentioned earlier, what are the sorts of things that customers are saying to me, the sorts of things that I'm talking to most of um, our customers about when it comes to how can we be able to prepare, I haven't got much to do with security, actually, in the main. It's to do with, in the main operational IT environments, are things uh, are they paying enough attention to certain things and there's you know things that we see time and time again being exploited no one on this call and anyone listening will not be familiar with you know unpatched vpns to start with with phishing mails and email security uh, there are now you know better tools available i come back to tools but they are there they're easy to implement there's not they're not that hard um in the supply chain there are uh, emerging tools that are much better at now being able to assess the risk within the supply chain so that's good but Taking the tool piece out of it, just think about the actual runtime IT. And Mike mentioned about the discipline of running IT, and that's the thing that I still think that we're lacking in. And I see time and time again in many organizations, that's the thing that's tripping them up, which is, yes, there may be a policy around patching. Yes, there's a risk assessment that's being done, but is that patching really getting down to all of those devices that are potentially the routine for a threat actor? Then if you take it to the sort of the next step, you know, Everyone but everyone has trouble with Active Directory. Uh, I hate to be overly technical about it, but it is something that sits right at the heart of most of the attacks that we see. Uh, there's some simple tools now, um, just simply de deploying MFA, making sure that password expiry is set to a much shorter period. You know, I still see you know, golden tickets out there with very long password expiry on them, uh, no info MFA implemented, and just general confusion about who's responsible for managing uh, the Active Directory environment itself, because it's not just one thing, it's a complex uh, series of different domains and forests and the like, uh, and controllers. So that's another area which uh, many organizations can pay a lot more, and it's not a security thing. It's, 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 it's the directory that sits at the heart of most organizations. Um, so look, a lot more that needs to be done and continue to be done in that interface between that, you know, this is what we need to do. And then is it really being done right across that ever complex uh, surface? And, you know, I could spend hours going on about, you know, in the application space and how containers are secured and all that, but we're not going to get into that. That's not what this is about. The point I'm trying to make is that there is a still a lot in the way organizations govern themselves understand what their state really is, and then apply the tooling that exists, and we've spent a lot of money on over many years, in a, in a way in which you really get the coverage. So that's the first thing. And the second part to this is then, yeah, okay, so all of that, let's assume that actually an organization has really got its arms around that, really knows what it has and where it's running, and is able to flex those controls according to the threat in, uh, in, in near real time. Then it's about, okay, so if those tools, tools and that telemetry is coming out, what are you doing about it? And again, has the organization got the, the ability to be able to respond in a way in which sometimes you have to take fairly draconian um, draconian action quite quickly? So Mike mentioned ransomware earlier on. So you know, one of the generally one considered to be most effective in the in the ransomware you know, attack chain, if you read the sort of MITRE attack framework and the NIST response, is containment. Containment often means that you're going to, as the word suggests, contain certain parts of the organization and, and make them you know, inaccessible to others at a moment's notice. That's quite a big decision, especially if you're in a manufacturing organization or something like that. Rehearsing that, understand who ha understanding who has the authority to make that decision and making it happen in near real time to stop you know, potentially malware proliferating through an organization so it could be contained that turns something from a 
pretty irritating incident that needs a response to something that becomes headline news and potentially stop price affecting, you know, the difference between those two things might only be a matter of minutes, literally. So it's that sort of ability for organizations to be able to reflect, to, to, to reflex at that near real time, which I still find many struggling with. So in a word, to answer your question, there is a lot that we spend, but the reality is that there's still the types of attacks that we're seeing are still exploiting fairly basic vulnerabilities that we're still not being able to get after. And then on top of that, there is a, an issue about even if the tooling is there, are organizations able to respond and take what can be quite far reaching decisions quickly enough to be able to contain the types of attacks that we're seeing? And, and just I, I could, human, sorry, sorry now Robert, go ahead. No, you go, you go, Mike. No, I was just going to say, and you, you'll know saying, I mean, it just on the ransomware thing, what's become really clear, if it wasn't already clear to the intelligence agencies, is the symbiotic relationship between Russian criminal gangs and the, uh, I, I was going to call it Troika, not Troika, whoever it is, Putin, and the people around him who run Russia. So I just, just narrowly, that, that was the only point I want to add, Rob, so, yeah. No, no I, I absolutely agree on that. But I agree with Mark, too, and I think the answer to your question, Mike, about you know, your experience um, back with the Iranian attacks is there is much more information around now. People, so the problem is making sense of it and responding to it quickly, uh, as Mark said. So I, I think um, you know, that there's, there's been progress, but there's still a long way to go to, and I think part of the answer will be automation for many organizations. It's about managed detection and response and, and getting that out of the hands of busy teams who are just swamped with data. Um, but I completely agree on, on Mark's point about the basics. And we did some work in the pandemic looking at the few hospitals that government was particularly worried about um, from the outside. If you look at from an attacker's perspective, because attackers are scanning all the time, whether nation states or or criminal groups. And as, as Mike, Mike says, there's often not much of a distinction. Um, and they're doing that continuously. And so they're spotting those basic IT hygiene problems like you know, open ports or uh, misconfigured um, remote management, especially. Uh, and I think um, if you're not doing that from the outside, and if you're not looking at your supply chain in the same way, you've got a you've got a problem. Um, and the, and the challenge is to do that at scale and fast enough to be useful to keep ahead of the attacker, really. Mm. And it's often said that it's, it's it's easier to attack than it is to defend in in, in cyber warfare. So. Is there is there anything to say that we should be more on the front foot, more on the offensive side in in terms of disrupting what is going on? Um, Robert, I mean, maybe you will be able to speak to more of what whether that is the case or not. I don't know. Well, I, I personally, I think you know, offensive is obviously the media love it because it, mm. you press a big red button and you take out something. And first of all, it's a lot more complicated than that, as Mike says. Um, this, these attacks and accesses take years to, to prepare, and the effects are often quite short-lived. Uh, and never mind the legal and ethical constraints, um, which apply certainly in the West, um, though obviously not to Putin. But I think you're right that we, we need to focus on, on defence rather than offence and leave offence to governments to do in you know, legal and targeted ways, mm. because it, it however good the offensive capabilities are, and they are very good, particularly in the States and in the UK, they're not going to make up and prevent an attack against a UK bank or any UK business or any US business. So um, they have their place, offensive cyber has its place, um, and that may grow in importance, but it's never going to be a substitute for good defence. No, understood. And and the reason why I ask is that obviously Ukraine are, are quite openly at the moment building their IT army, as they call it, or their cyber army of, of what is um, often volunteers coming in and, and from other hacktivist groups that are coming in to, to kind of support the what is a defensive strategy, but in quite an offensive um, methodology. But I mean, Mike, from, from your perspective, do you at a board level, to, is it the, the, the hacktivism side of things or the uh, the, the non-state sponsor side of things that seems more important or, or is it the state side of things that seem more important? I, 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 uh, I think it's criminals. Mm. I think it's state actors. I think it, it is uh, also, you know, around groups like Anonymous who want to attack anything that's part of the establishment. 
At the moment, they seem to have apparently quite successfully attacked some elements of Russia, which would be a welcome distraction. But, you, you know, it, it's all of these things, whether your government, whether it's embarrassing people for political reasons, whether it's attacking for financial purposes and crime, whether it's facilitation of crime, whether it's state actors using crime to get at you, destroying financial systems and undermining you or finding intelligence, whether it's historically, you know, um, other state actors trying to get the research and development, you know, how did the Chinese quite develop a swing wing aircraft so quickly and, uh, and so on and so forth. The, these things are all, I mean, and I think Robert touched on hospitals. I mean, it's very clear that there were massive attempts to gain access into this, the research that was going on in the development of vaccines, for example. Uh, it's very clear we, we've seen it at Great Ormond Street where I'm chairman. I mean, why, to be honest, I mean, the, the NHS is reasonable, but my goodness, you know, we're pretty, you know, we remain a little bit vulnerable and some of it, it is also around just finding, you know, we, we're a research hospital. Um, so they're trying to find research that they can sell. I mean, literally is down to, can they pick up on research to accessing emails to professors and brilliant people who are less disciplined in these areas. And then, you know, people are getting hold of this, passing it on to their own son, you know, so you've got this attempt to then sell those things ahead of the pace at which we can develop. So, I mean, Every, you know, you, the, you've got to be, you know, it's looking at what your industry is, where your exposures are, and recognize it's on a pretty broad framework, you know, of potential risks you have. You, you know, obviously, you can't be totally obsessed by it, but you've really got to have the basic discipline in place. You've really got to focus on what your windows of risk are and, and, and continuously remind people because people, you know, you go for a period of no one talks about it and everyone kind of relaxes a bit. You know, and the, the story is a myriad of people, you know, giving other people their passwords, uh, you know, le, le, you know, leaving them written down somewhere. I mean, all the things that we've been referring to, all of us. So, look, yeah, I mean, that's that's the breadth that you have to be concerned about. It is. It's, there's more, more than just one thing. Sorry, Robert. Well, I think there's something I agree. And I think there's something really interesting going on generationally, which Putin certainly hasn't spotted. Um, and it's very relevant to your business, Hubert, actually, because... And we've seen a report from Russia of large numbers of young IT professionals leaving the country because they don't want to be uh, holed up there. Uh, Ukraine has this very active young IT population who the government is now recruiting into a kind of citizen IT army, as you said. We've had ransomware groups like Conti splitting down the middle because the Russian members wanted to fight for Russia and the Ukrainian members said they weren't so happy with that. And, um, and anonymous, as, as Mike mentioned, you've got Brazilian ransomware groups of that same kind of demographic age group lining up for Russia and some of them splitting off. So there's something very interesting happening about the sort of crowdsourcing of, of IT um, uh, warfare and cyber attacks, which we, we haven't seen before and we don't quite know where it's going to go, but it's going to be very interesting to watch. Mm, no, I think that's a very, a very interesting point. Uh, Mark, from, from your perspective, yeah. businesses that are, that are more outside of this critical national infrastructure space, are they, are they being as, as, uh, are they as aware of, of the risk to them or do they feel we're not in that CNI area, therefore we're, we're not as much of a target? No, I would say absolutely everyone is very is very aware of of what's going on. Um, and 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 just to reflect on a couple of things, it's it's almost quite peculiar how this is, has 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 developed, and even just in the last couple of days, because you know we've seen some stuff in that with anonymous as it would be mentioned. Yeah, you know, that's not what we necessarily had in the playbook that we'd see those groups then uh, becoming you know almost as they see the self style champions of uh, of, of you know, the sort of the anti Russia type movement. And um, that 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 has been quite peculiar because it's not it, it's it, it, you know, it's not something that we originally you know, were thinking very much of state sponsored attacks type things and and now this has emerged uh, and where customers as we've seen in the last 24 hours are being actively targeted by by some of those groups that wasn't necessarily in the playbook but you know this is all um, emerging to a certain extent so that's quite interesting um, and how and how that is going to continue to emerge and then the implication of that not just against targeting various companies, but then targeting those companies that then have a big impact further through the supply chain as well. Mm. And, you know, I think in the last 24 hours, my view, there's stuff that's going on that I've seen that it's almost too much of coincidence that would, that would say that it's not necessarily related in, in some way, shape or form. And this is now the moment that we're seeing this really ramping up, wherein 
I think Robert said it before in the last couple of weeks, there's been a sort of like, well, we haven't seen as much as we thought we would see. So back to the uh, back to the point though around customers themselves and those companies that aren't necessarily the ones that are necessarily on the list. Absolutely not. Organizations are all very acutely aware of it. I'm being contacted and talking to many different organizations on a daily basis who want to know, as I said earlier, what the contingencies are, what they should be planning for, what are the drills and things that they should be focused on to go through. Because as we all know on this call, it's not just about that CNI organization. It's about what ecosystem that they are in, what their supply chain is. Many organizations, even large organizations, obviously are big suppliers to those types of organizations and indeed vice versa. So there's all those vicarious links that are established between organizations, whether it's contractors and whether it's how they're provisioned into those environments as contractors and how they work in there, whether it's straight software, all of those different considerations now. So absolutely many organizations are acutely aware of that and in many respects, perhaps more aware of it than they have been before, which I think is a, a really good thing because it comes back to my overarching point this morning that you know all the you know all the tools in the world but if you don't understand what that attack surface is and that and how your organization actually operates right through the supply chain then you you know you're potentially going to be vulnerable and um and i i think that there's almost an acceleration of that understanding now um of course those organizations that are being mentioned and and uh, you know being spoken to specifically by the various agencies around uh where the intelligence is available they are even more focused on it perhaps um, but that's not to say that everyone else isn't there's certainly my experience so far no one is sitting back and going yeah well, that's that's their issue not ours and there's there's a balance between awareness and and, and action on it and, and often this this comes with considerable cost to businesses as well to keep spending on improving their cyber defenses and, and so on and so forth so mark do you see that companies are continuously investing in it or is there ever a reluctance to to, to need to spend the money on on what you would advise has to be done yeah i think it's, there's a lot of choices and there have all been you know COVID has driven a lot of choices you know let's not forget we're not at the on the other side of COVID at all uh, many organizations have been impacted fundamentally and have been you know almost virtually ceased to trade in the last couple of years putting themselves back around from some of the very serious financial impact that many organizations have had has had a, absolutely has had an impact on spending uh, and um, and often you know not that security I would ever deem to be discretionary spending but you know when organizations are absolutely having to really look at every single cent penny whatever to, you know there are there are things that you know maybe be put back especially when you think of things like uh, things that might not be directly security related but have a huge impact in security like you know end of service life and how uh, equipment refresh cycles are done both hardware and software you know those types of decisions can then have quite a big uh, implication in security because then things become harder to patch and harder to, to modernize um so i think that there hasn't been any in my experience direct you know security has come through this in a way in which spending still remains there However, there is certainly a massive, much bigger focus on value for money and is, is really are the returns being seen from that which is being invested. And also now a, a almost a bit of a level set where we've seen some uh, security, security ecosystems emerging. Um, and I'll mention one specifically around Microsoft, for example, which many on the call will probably know about, where some of that tooling now is becoming mature to the point where organizations are looking very carefully at what they're panoply of tooling is and saying, look, can we now replace some stuff if we're a high license user for Microsoft, like an E5 user? Is there stuff that we already have that we've already bought essentially that we could then replace other stuff with? So I think less of a direct impact on spending, you know, crashing, much more of an impact on what value are we getting? What programs do we need to accelerate that aren't necessarily about buying stuff, but are more about how we organize and manage ourselves and also are there now things where we can say we can take advantage of some of the more emerging ecosystems that mean that we can uh, displace some of the existing tooling that is perhaps been hard to use, hard to integrate, but now is easier with some of those ecosystems. It's not just Microsoft, there's others as well. Uh, and so that's what I have seen, as well as clearly a focus on IT estates have changed uh, and, uh, and now a much bigger focus on 
you know, applications containerization and how we secure that and the march to uh, zero trust as well. So those are uh, those not a not a, a an absolute fall in spending, more of a change in focus and a bigger focus on value for money. Mm, interesting. Um, from um, just coming back to the point around the the. The, the the hacktivist groups and i'm interested to get thoughts on on the fact that whilst states don't necessarily or can't can't influence the agenda of these these hacktivist groups that are that are growing and, and and being more prevalent in um in modern day cyber society however they're almost at an arm's distance and it's argue, arguably able to say that they're helping in the circumstance with russia to to make these uh these these offensive attacks to russia to to distract things but it's not being perceived as being state-led. Does that in the bigger picture help things or is there a risk in, in the growth of these groups, do you think? Robert? Well, I think the, the, it's a pretty uh, um, vibrant sector already. I don't know that it needs to grow much. I mean, it's very, uh, it, it's very widespread and these groups tend to be based in countries that have good connectivity and um, corrupt or non-existent law enforcement um, and clearly there is as Mike said earlier an overlap with the political particularly in Russia um, these groups are have a relationship with the state um, and are sometimes used as proxies sometimes taxed in a, a standard corruption way um, and sometimes you know actively part of the state um, uh, mechanism so uh, it's going to be a problem. You might remember that uh, Biden and Putin had a discussion about ransomware and said they were going to cooperate, but frankly, nothing came of that from Russia. And you know, until Russia becomes a country with an independent rule of law uh, and actually is willing to bear down on these criminal groups, it's quite difficult to see how we solve the problem because you can only do a certain amount, even with the reach of the US and the FBI, you can only do a certain amount from outside. Um, and you can do a certain amount technically, you, but um, really, it, it's a it's a political problem, uh, mm. and I don't see those type of criminals going away anytime soon. And that's without the sort of the lower level, if you like, of criminals who are just um, out there freelancing. Mm. No, I really understand. And, and Mike, coming back to to kind of the the the, the board perspective, a, a board seeing this as the, the trend for the future and it's never going to change this this advancement of, of cyber warfare and, and cyber attacks so therefore they have to to make it more of an important element in in the management of these large enterprises i, I, I think we've sort of touched on it that the real issue is keeping continuing focus on it boards tend let's say even in a big public company they might meet eight or nine times a year they have many items they are required to go through from a governor's point of view many areas strategic they need to go through and you tend to you know it's what i call the balloon principle you tend to squeeze the balloon periodically on a particular issue to see what's going on and sometimes if you have a period of relative calm when uh, there are no particular events at least that have been publicized and very often by the way ransomware settlements are never publicized at all because people just pay through crypto and get on with life so I think there is a need to keep a continuous observation and, and oversight of the, uh, of, of the sharpness of the cyber defense. You know, I, I do think that's important. And I do think boards are definitely better than they were. And actually, you know, for, for quite some time, the intelligence agencies have been speaking out in publicly. I think the first one was Jonathan Evans when he was at MI5. That must be 15 years ago wrote a letter to every single FTSE 100 company on the risks and what was actually already going on. So I, I think definitely not perfect. And definitely, I think, as I, as I think we've all said, these events and the expectation so far of something happening, um, uh, you know, is again getting most companies to ask their IT guys, their finance guys, their security guys, you know, where are we and are we, you know, are we keeping people on their toes? Are we reminding people, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's where, where I think where I think it is. Mm. And with um, with circumstances where there are 
technologies or, or parts of the supply chain that might have, uh, have originated from, from Russian companies and so on and so forth. So I'm kind of alluding to the circumstance of, the, of German's comments on the, the uh, Kapersky um, technologies and software as advising businesses to, to take caution if they have them um, embedded in their in their business or their supply chain. Do you, do you think that is a, a fair comment or, or should there be a certain amount of trust that these businesses do have a degree of separation from the state? Well, um, you know, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm, um, it's very convenient, isn't it, for the Russians and actually the Chinese when they were very active. I mean, to, to some extent, their technology is so advanced, they're worried about us stealing from them. But, uh, you know, it's very convenient for the Russians, the Chinese to be able to say, well, it's not us, Gov, which is what Putin says. It's very convenient. And yet it's clearly alignment in both states uh, in, in relation to this matter. And I, I think Robert said it. I mean, we, we do have to, in the West, stand for some principles, you know, uh, of how we behave. On the other hand, you know, there are many times in history, you know, there have been some very interesting books written uh, around the role of the mafia in helping the allies invade Italy, uh, you know, which you wouldn't have necessarily expected. So, but it is... Uh, you know, an important part of maintaining the principles of a liberal democratic society and how you operate. And, uh, you know, there is a price you pay for that uh, in the short term. Um, and you have to hope that, you, you, you know, the overall sort of support for a liberal democratic society uh, with the freedoms we're used to uh, and setting an example by the behavior we exhibit as countries is really important, particularly when you see, we've seen it for the last, what, increasingly for the last 10 years, populist autocratic regimes, whether it's Putin or Xi or Duarte or Bolsonaro, even to some degree Trump, and even some people would say in some elements in the UK here, we've seen much more populist, much more nationalistic rhetoric. And it, it's a very difficult time, I think, in terms of all these factors coming together and, and these tensions emerging in Europe you know, in, in a way that we would never, I don't think anyone really expected until very recently that Russia would further 2014 invade the whole of Ukraine, you know, um, uh, you know, but they did, they did. And what more could they do? Robert, is there anything you can add to that? Sorry, I interrupted you. Well, I, I think on Kaspersky, it's, um, you have to ask yourself, you know, if you're a Russian based company or Chinese based and the FSB come along to you and tell you to do something, can you say no? Well, the answer is you can't. So with the best will in the world, you have to you have to treat them differently. And the problem with an antivirus product is however good it is. And you know, I think lots of people would say it's a, you know, one, a good, good product, but um, it has to have access to your machine to do its job and it has to be able to write code into your machine to do its job and if you don't fully trust um what you're getting that's a that's a big problem which is why the germans and the us before them and the uk have said uh, we've got we, we've got to treat this with extreme caution but i i think there's a there's a false assurance in thinking that the only supply chain risk comes from a Russian based company that's that sadly is not the case you know most of the most sophisticated russian attacks have come through um, household names in the West. So they get embedded in the, or non-household names like the Ukrainian uh, accountancy company, but yeah, SolarWinds Corporation, for example, and there are plenty of others. Um, that, as, Mark, as Mark said earlier, that's where we need to worry. Um, it, you know, identifying a company that is based in Russia is a pretty small part of the problem, really. Mm. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely echo that. And and it, you know, a, a take you have to approach anything with caution, and especially on how and where you deploy it. So again, it comes back to this understanding what your architecture is, and then saying, look, you know, the, the risk of putting this particular piece of software equipment or whatever it is, regardless, as Robert said, of whether it's got a Russian sounding name or any sounding name, and, and SolarWinds is obviously the the classic example of that. Um, is is what you you have to be attuned to being able to to assess. Uh, and make that good. Now, when we look at the, the the direction of travel in terms of uh, in terms of services more broadly, especially with the more the emergence of SaaS services, for example, that actually there's some goodness in there because uh, you know that 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 can help if 
the organization that you're procuring those services from is ta are taking it very seriously um, because they, you get a sort of economy of scale approach, which is that they have to be and very mindful of that as much as you do in terms of the risk that you might be facing yourself with. Now, I'm not advocating, therefore, let everyone go out and just buy SaaS services, but I am saying that there are some considerations in those environments that actually may give you a bit of a leg up um, instead of then having to go through that grind of assessing everything yourself and then being in a situation where you're having to make those fairly fine, uh, finely based risk based decisions about how you deploy anything back to the point just it's not about having a having a a, a, a a name that sounds like it's come from Russia or wherever else it's about everything because making sure that you have that a risk assessment approach working in the right way is absolutely critical so um that really is the challenge but looking for ways in which you can use aggregation from others uh, to help with that, but whilst also being very mindful of, even with SaaS services, you know, you're using them in a certain way. You're, I don't know, if you're using mail services, for example, you're, you're, it's still what's contained within your mail and how sensitive it is and how much encryption you apply. All those things, just because it exists, it needs to be implemented and managed properly to be able to give you the level of control that you need to manage your risk proportionately. Now, that sounds like a lot of words, but it's relatively straightforward is, you know, turn stuff on. Um, which can sometimes get in the way uh, only when you really need to, but you must do it when you really do have to. And conversely, if you don't need to, then you can manage that risk in, in that way. So I think it still comes back to, yes, there's a headline piece in there, but as Robert's saying, it's much, much broader than just a name. Um, and in any case, it comes down to understanding how you deploy something and then the risk that it's going to, uh, going to either help mitigate or not. Specifically in the situation with antivirus, it's a slightly peculiar one because, of course, that is a mitigating control against security risk in the first place. So it's uh, to me that is a, a, a one of those things that you have to be particularly focused on, making sure that you really do have something that you know that you can trust because it's there to provide that that security control in the first place. And obviously, businesses at the moment, as you're all saying, are, are very aware of the circumstances of the threats and, and whether they need to be bolstering their, their cyber defences. Is there enough shared information around there, around the, what the, the threat vectors are and the actors are at the moment? These The, the NCSC have, have advised businesses to procure, procure threat feeds um, that, are, that are relevant to, to the heightened threat circumstances at the moment. But... Do we have enough awareness as to how these threats are coming in, the, the amount of different channels they could for businesses to actually give themselves a good chance of, of defending themselves? Robert? I think so. I think sharing has got much, much better. I know in the States there are some particular problems which they've, 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 they're overcoming and they have, they have a different uh, issue there. But uh, Congress has agreed on uh, mandatory sharing of, of uh, a mandatory reporting um, and that's a big breakthrough and there's always been a problem in the state sharing information from private sector to government um, so that's a constitutional issue which i think they are tackling um, over here I, I, and, and in europe i think there is plenty of sharing going on and it's much better than it used to be could be better but the big issue and it goes back to something mark said really is what you do with all this information mm. It's fine to get tons of threat feeds, um, uh, all very interesting, but actually being able to do something with it, so actionable threat intelligence is, is what you need, and we have some way to go on that. Yeah. Would you agree, Mark? Yes, I would. I would. I think, I think there is still a reticence, I think much less so than there, than there has been in the past. Uh, I think actually it's not less of a didactic thing. So it's less of a less of a thing where we sit, that people sit there and say, "Oh no, I'm not ever going to share anything." It's about what people share. I think we're getting to that point now where people sort of go, "Well, is that something that we really do need to, um, you know, start broadcasting far and wide in amongst the communities that we that we know and trust?" Uh, and there's that sort of you know you can get caught in the trap of sharing everything, or you know, and then thinking, "Well, I'll decide what the threshold is," and something that might be a relatively what you think is something fairly benign uh, could be really re very serious to, to another organization. So I think we're still feeling our way there. I think the will, uh, as Robert just said, in terms of wanting to share and being prepared to um, has changed markedly because I think everyone now begins to realize that there is real mutual benefit 
uh, in sharing the information. Uh, I, for one, in our business, I'm very, very keen with our with our customers that when we we see things, you know, and we see in indicators of compromise and other things, we we share those as as quickly as we can. Uh, and I found that to be extremely productive because I get then a lot back. Um, so it, it still feels we have some way to go to really industrialize that. Uh, and of course, when you're when you're sharing something, as I said before, you, you're 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 lacking the context that the other party that you're sharing to uh, has and needs it to. So I I are on the side of share more rather than less on the basis that you know. I can't second guess what the context is that 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 could be meaningful to another organization. Um, but then you're left with the problem of then you get just, you know, lots and lots of stuff coming at you and then how do you deal with it? And I think Robert said it earlier on automation is the thing that hopefully is really going to help us get and move on a lot that we can then start running that through our threat hunting mechanisms uh, to ensure that we don't have to have people staring at it all the time. Um, having said that, Let's not forget it's often through those curious individuals who are security people, who are you know, calm and curious, who pull threads every day for a living and look at stuff and go, that doesn't look quite right. And then they pull the thread hard and then you know, look what happens and look what they find. So I think um, I would absolutely encourage uh, informally or not mandated or not, and I'm conscious of the, of the uh, legislation that's currently going through the Hill in, in, uh, in the US um, that informally in any case we can do lots in terms of sharing stuff and we do that in any case and i would encourage everyone else who's listening today to, to do the same uh and then uh you know help uh, you collectively if you want raise the uh, raise the tide so all the boats rise together having said that there are specifics that that need to be mandated on some organizations to make sure that really does happen and that becomes more industrial i mean i think hubert we're, we're probably beginning to come to the to the end of the session but i think one thing on a very positive note that I saw and experienced and was lucky to experience when, when, during the time I was heavily involved in these matters at PT is the very high level of cooperation, A, across our own intelligence agencies between the security service and the intelligence, secret intelligence service and GCHQ. And also when I was in NSA, one of the things the Brigadier General at the time in charge went at length to tell me that the NSA could not operate without GCHQ. So there really is a symbiotic and important relationship. And I think this extends through five eyes and increasingly works, I think, Robert, better and better. So there is a mutuality of interest at the macro level in observing and working together to try and deal with identifying, you know, who the bad, who we know who the bad actors are. So I, I think there's enormous resource there, which increasingly is available to companies to use and is much more transparently you know put out and we we don't have the problem in this country of i think R robert would confirm i think but he should be you know the complexity of the multiple different agencies in the u.s make sharing and we saw that classically in 9 11 uh you know but you know we're very lucky that we have a a small number of very high highly professional agencies who work together. I can't remember what the figure Robert was or Mark, but I think there was something like 40 or 50 different agencies in the US trying to coordinate data and information, including some very high profile ones, obviously like the NSA, the FBI, the CIA and others. But I think we're in, in that sense, we're in a good position here in this country. No, that's reassuring to hear. But yes, indeed, you are. You are right, Mike. We're coming to a, to the to the hour um, for the um, for the session. And um, thank you all for for the time to 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 give us today. I think it's been a really interesting discussion, and um, certainly learned a huge amount around the current state of affairs and how businesses are approaching it. So I hope that to everybody that that does watch this, there's uh, some key takeaways that they can apply to their businesses or the thought processes within their board environments as well at the moment. But um, um, is there any kind of final leaving notes, Robert, that you'd you'd uh, you'd finish off with? Well, I think broadly, I'm I'm an optimist. I think there are things changing that will, in the medium to long term, really improve things. One is, as Mark said, the move to cloud and the cloud providers, especially Microsoft, but others following, really investing in security, which gives will give most companies, even enterprise level, better visibility and better protection than they've ever had. So that's that's good. There's lots of government stuff, regulation that improve the security being built in by design to new products and to and eventually to software development. So there are lots of reasons in the medium to long term to be optimistic, but it's it's going to be difficult in the 
in the short to medium term, I think, is my, my view. And Mark, uh, a final note from yourself. Yep, get the basics right. So uh, look at your external perimeter. You can scan it just as much as a threat actor can. So do that uh, if, you're, if you have the ability to get that done in the organization. Then focus on the remediation on those devices that need to be dealt with at that perimeter to top ingress. And then go about looking at the active directory environment and making sure the controls are there and that basics like MFA are in place. Uh, you know, just do that. That will go a long way to help. Uh, and uh, all the other stuff we all know, but those few things I say con constantly every time. Oh, and then finally, if you are running backups, make sure you air gap those backups. Backups as they've traditionally been architected are not robust enough for the ransomware type of attack. So those are three things, very basic. Just do those if nothing else, and you could be in a lot better position. Yep. Amazing. Mike, anything for yourself to-, to no, I, I think I said, I mean, I, I agree completely that Technology is going to help us in a way as we move through this, but in the meantime, we need to pay attention. Super. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed for your time. Highly appreciated, and um, I look forward to speaking to you all again soon.